Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. And today we have a great scientist with us who is going to help us to do exactly that. His name is Dr. Russell Humphreys, and Dr. Humphreys is a, a Ph.D. in physics uh, from LSU. That's your yep. alma, alma mater. Mm -hmm. And uh, he worked for many years at the Sandia uh, National Laboratories and uh, mostly in nuclear physics, although you've done all kinds of physics. Yeah, all kinds. I'm a general purpose physicist. Uh, uh, we're, so. we're thrilled to have you with us today, and we're going to talk about magnetic fields. Now, I know the Earth has a magnetic field. Do other bodies in space have magnetic fields as well? Yes, they do. Uh, they either now have one or in the past they had one, as from all the evidence we have. Now, you've done a lot of work in this area and actually have developed some theories of your own, is that right? Yes, I have. And so. we're excited to hear about them, so please share with us. Okay. First, I should say a magnetic field is, is what makes compass needles point north. So right. if, if you were on some other planets now that still have a magnetic field, they would have a north and a south pole and the compass would point toward them. It would point not necessarily north, but wherever the magnetic field was on that planet. Right. Yes. And in fact, on some planets, uh, the they are not a, there's some of the magnetic poles are near the equator. Uh, yeah. It's, it's that funny. would be interesting. So, but uh, I was interested in how God started up these magnetic fields. And um, I found a biblical clue to this that we'll get into this. But the, the bottom line is that God used water to make magnetic fields on all these planets and stars in the cosmos. So, the raw material is water. Right. Okay. He, he started with water and then converted it to other things, but the water is a, was an important clue to me. So this theory that I did a long time ago, actually, explains the magnetic fields of, uh, of those planets, like Jupiter. Jupiter has a whopping magnetic field. And uh, uh, stars, most stars seem to have magnetic fields uh, that we've observed. And galaxies, big clusters of stars, uh, they have their own magnetic field. And uh, the electrons are what usually makes magnetic fields. In, in a bar magnet, it's the electrons in the iron atoms. But in, in water, all the electrons spin in opposite directions, so their magnetic fields cancel out. But uh, the hydrogen nuclei, you know, it's H2. There's two H's in the center of those atoms. Um, are spinning little balls of charge. And uh, those spinning electric charges make magnetic fields. Yeah. Huh. They're, they're only a thousandth the strength of the magnetic field of an electron because they're rotating slower. But they're still there. So uh, the hydrogen nuclei in water normally turn, you know, are pointed every which way, so there's no overall magnetic field. And so you don't notice uh, any magnetic effects to your glass of water. But the magnetic fields are there in the little nuclei. So uh, the hydrogen molecule is slightly magnetic, but it depends on which way the spins are in those little spinning balls of charge as to what happens. So why is this important? Because God formed the Earth, and I'm going to suggest all the other big bodies in the sky from water that he created, and then transformed to other materials. And where do I get such a crazy theory as that? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5. The earth was formed out of water and by water, or by means of water. And the Greek is even stronger than the, that particular English translation. That's, um, you know, this is one of the amazing things to me about the Bible, mm -hmm. Dr. Humphreys, is that here we have a verse where Peter's really not talking about creation. Mm -hmm. He's really talking about the end of the world more than the beginning of the world, I think, there. And yet, here he, he just throws in this little phrase, the earth was formed out of water and by water. Yeah. Obviously, the Holy Spirit wanted us to know that. Yeah, I think he did. And he yeah. included it in, in God's Word. Yeah. And then, you know... Uh, 2,000 years later, the same Holy Spirit that impressed Peter to write that puts into you a desire to understand this and to share it with the rest of us. I just yeah. think God's Word's amazing. I do too. And uh, there's a little clue to it in Genesis chapter 1. You know, the, uh, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And that right. sounds like a lot of water. And the Spirit of God was moving on the face of the waters. 
So it looks like, I was, my theory anyhow suggests that God made everything first as water and then transform that water obviously to other stuff pretty quickly. That's amazing. But the, uh, the thing that hit me about that verse was, well, if he made all the hydrogen nuclei all spin in the same direction, all, all spinning in one particular direction, then all their magnetic fields, those little ones, would add up to a big magnetic field. And I didn't know how big it was, so I quickly calculated it. And it's enough to explain the magnetic fields of the Earth and planets and stars and everything else. So here's a picture right here. Let's see if I can get this thing going. Each one of those is one of those little hydrogen nuclei. Okay. And uh, they're all pointed in the same direction. And that's the key. In the initial they, instant. They kind of neutralize each other out unless they're all going one yes, way. Yes, if they were all spinning in different yeah. directions, right. then they wouldn't. Okay. And in ordinary water, the molecules bang into each other. And I'm suggesting this was ordinary water. So after a few seconds, all those nuclei would get disoriented. Uh, but uh, right at the beginning, the initial instant, uh, it would line, it, they would be lined up and make a large magnetic field, the theory says. Now, I didn't know that my theory would work out to, to anything good, so this was just a science theory and uh, based on this verse of scripture. So uh, now if you figure the strength of the field, it works out to be about uh, 16 times stronger than today's magnetic field on Earth. And that 7.9 Gauss is, is uh, 16 times stronger than the half a Gauss or so. That's a physicist's term for how much a magnetic field, how strong it is. All right. So, uh, so now, uh, let's go on with this little theory. Now, the, the created magnetism depends on the mass of the body that God, God is making because the bigger the planet, the more water he used to make it up, and so the more magnetic, uh, more hydrogen nuclei all lined up. So uh, this is for the scientist in the, in the audience. Uh, the strength of the magnetic field depend, is a certain constant times the mass of the planet, says his theory. Okay. So I know how much Matter is in all the planets. Uh, we know that from various other things. So I should be able to know how strong the magnetic field was when God created it. So then there's something that, uh, that happens to the magnetic field after that. Oh, oh, I should tell you, in case I slip and say magnetic flux, that's a physicist term. By the way, Michael Faraday, a great creationist physicist of the early 1900s, uh, uh, invented this term, but uh, flux means lines of force. If you, uh, if you plot um, with a compass needle from a magnet and say put a piece of paper over it, you can plot these lines of force just by following the direction of the compass needle. Hmm. And these lines of force are, uh, are important uh, to keep track of if you're a physicist. So, so when God made the, the magnetic field first, he produced these lines of force from the spinning hydrogen nuclei. And, but then what happens in the water is that the molecules would collide and they would make the spins point every which way. But that, according to the laws of electricity and magnetism, would start up an electric current in the water. See, the Earth's magnetic field today comes from an electric current in the core. There's, there's no lined up magnetic uh, fields of hydrogen nuclei today. Uh, but within seconds after God created the water, bang, 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 uh, there would, an electric current would start up in the water, just according to today's laws of electricity and magnetism. So there's the current right there. I guess I don't understand how the collision starts the electric current. Will you yeah, help me? Yeah. Thank uh, you. It's the way God made magnetic fields and electric currents to work to begin with, the right. laws of, of electricity and magnetism. He made... Uh, if you try to change the magnetic field and there's an electric conductor around and the center of this water would be hot and it would be a good electric conductor. So if there's an electric conductor around, uh, you, if you flip one of the spins to a different direction, that tries to reduce the magnetic field and that starts up a little current in the water 
to try to maintain the magnetic field at what it was before. And then another spin flips, and another little increment of magnetic uh, field tries to change, and that starts a little more current. Okay. And within seconds after all this happens, uh, you're going to have a large electric current in the water, and you're going to have no more lined up spins. Everything is now one big current. Right. And you're going to have a large current, 130 billion amperes of electric current. That's a lot of current, um, even for a big planet. And the magnetic field conserves itself. You see, it tries, God made magnetic fields to try to... to want to keep going. To want to keep going. So very quickly, within seconds, it switches from spins to a big electric current. And uh, it was a large electric current, 130 billion amperes 6,000 years ago. And uh, that's enough to account for the Earth's field today. Well, the Earth is not made of water right now. <clears throat> it's mostly other stuff, like, what, like rocks and silicon and iron and other things like that. So, uh, but this magnetic, the magnetic lines of force according to the laws of electricity and magnetism, tend to stay the same. There would be the same number of lines of magnetic force, no matter what happened. So when God transformed that solid, uh, that, that water into today's materials, the magnetic force would be preserved. So you still have an electric current, but it's now down in the the electrically conductive Earth's core, which is 2,000 miles beneath our feet. Okay. So now something happens to the Earth's flux after that, uh, but in this transformation it stayed the same. And the mass of the Earth was the same as the mass of the water. So now what happens is that the, Earth, the, the current runs down like a, 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 a flywheel. Uh, you know, a, fly, a spinning flywheel has a lot of inertia, it keeps running, right. but it's, it's suspended by something and it's running through air, so the friction slows the flywheel down. And the electric current in large planets is just the same as that. It, it has sort of an electromagnetic inertia, but it slowly runs down because uh, the electric current is meeting resistance in the core, see? Okay, I understand that. So, uh, just like the flywheel slows down. And so now this is a graph for the techies in the audience, and we're going to plot time in 6,000 years from the beginning of the Earth right here to now. Uh, and the electric current would start at that 130 million amperes and decline slowly down to today's six I said million, I meant billions, 130 billion amperes to down to six billion amperes. And it would follow a certain law of falling uh, normally. If nothing happens in the meantime, uh, it would decrease by half every 2,000 years. So now we're down to about a little less than an eighth of, of today's, of the original. And it's still current. declining. And it's still declining today. Okay. Should I worry about that? No. Okay. Uh, not unless you're a, a bird that navigates by the field. All right. Some birds use it, use it, have the internal compass. I probably have enough to worry about, so we'll just let, the, okay. let it go. Okay. So I went and applied, I, this theory worked so well for the Earth that I went and applied it to the planets in our solar system. Uh, and uh, I used this little law here that the, the Decay time, the half-life, how fast the, the field decays, depends on how electrically conductive the core of the planet is and the radius, the size of the core. And so uh, that was important. And so in the smaller planets, the, the, the lines of force that God created, the magnetic field, decayed fast because the, the size of the core was small. So now, this is another thing for the techies. I'm going to plot the, the mass of a planet along the bottom, and then I'm going to plot these magnetic flux lines of force uh, on a special kind of graph 
uh, where the vertical scale is really compressed. And so that theory of mine says the created flux would be proportional to the mass. So you see this blue line along the top I do. here. That's where the theory says the planet started. And by the way, you notice that the sun's right up there and Jupiter's right up there. They're both big, very big objects in the sky. So they have most of the magnetic field that they started with. But the smaller and smaller the planets, the less, the more the deviation from that line, the smaller the field is. So uh, the decay depends on the size of the planet and the material it's made of. So the moon is way down here. Yeah. And it, its field actually may be less than that. Some of these things they haven't been able to measure a field on, so they know it's less than a certain number. So here's Mars. It doesn't have much magnetic field now, but the Earth has a fair amount still and other planets in between. So the theory um, turned out to fit what they had measured for magnetic fields of planets pretty well. Now, let me plot the magnetic field decay on a different kind of graph for you here. Uh, this is, again, more for techies. But on this kind of graph, that slow decay uh, works out as a straight line. So planet fields decayed at different rates. And again, I'm plotting time along the bottom from creation to now, zero to 6,000 years. And my theory gives the magnetic field or the amount of lines of force uh, for each object. So the sun started off with a whole lot because the sun is a whopping Bigger big mass. mass. Right. And uh, so, but down here, Pluto, uh, very small, and its moon, Charon, is even smaller. Uh, so they had not much magnetic field to begin with. But each field would decay, and the less the mass of the planet, the faster its field generally decays. And here we have today's moon's magnetic field. It could be less than that. Mars, uh, Ganymede, for example, is a moon of Jupiter. Here's the Earth, planets Uranus and Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter. Uh, all of these things, says the theory, um, would decay at different rates. So we can figure out things about the planet's core, how electrically conductive it is from that, because they can guess at how big the core is, but they don't know exactly how electrically conductive it is. So well, we find that the electrical conductance, uh, the, the, you know, how well it conducts electricity, depends on the density of the planet. Uh, and it falls in, they fall into two groups. So this is electrical conductivity on one side here. And here is density. Uh, okay. It's amazing. Uh, so you notice there's two groups here. There's planets that are a lot like Earth, that are dense. They have a lot of material uh, packed into a small space in them. Uh, Earth and Mars and Venus are all like that. And all their electrical conductivities, this theory says, fall in the same general group. And then there's another kind that's made mostly of gas. They're fluffier, but they're really big. So they're gas giants. Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Jupiter uh, all fall into a different area in the diagram. So the theory is happy with that or at least I was happy that the theory <laughs> said that. So let's see if I can get it to move now. So I wrote this up in 1984, and the predictions of that theory seem to have all been fulfilled. The theory seems to say to us that uh, the, the thicker the mass, the, the greater the, uh, the uh, electrical conductivity. Am I saying that right? If it's a dense planet, it has, has more has high electrical conductivity, right. it conducts electricity well, right. but if it's a gas giant, it's low, and, and that seems to fit the data we have. And in 84, you wrote up the predictions, and yeah. uh, they all seem to have fulfilled, so it seems to verify your theory, is that right? Yeah, we'll talk about the predictions after the break. All right, well, I'm, I'm fascinated to see how this is all going to work out, and I know you are too. Don't you go away, we'll be right back.
Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Russell Humphreys, is a physicist and speaker with Creation Ministries International. Russ did scientific research for 22 years at Sandia National Laboratories and has published some 20 papers in secular scientific journals. He is the author of Starlight and Time, where he proposes a model for a young universe. Book orders are being taken at 800-616-1264. Russ has also been involved with The Rate Project, which has produced breakthroughs on the subject of radiometric dating. Dr. Humphreys can be reached at Creation Ministries International, P.O. Box 350, Atlanta, Georgia, 30127. Or visit the website, www.creation.com. We are back with Dr. Russell Humphreys. We've been talking about magnetic fields. And we're talking about a paper that he wrote in 1984. And he took a theory. And you know, when you're a scientist and you develop a theory and put it out there, you sort of put your reputation on the line, don't you? Especially if you say, if my theory is right, we should see this and this when we get around to measuring it. You can have a theory if you can never verify it. No one can ever prove you're right. wrong. Right. And so a good scientific theory, uh, creationist theories should do this, as well as secular theories, right. uh, should go out on a limb and say, if my theory is right, then we should be able to see this. So, there's always some people standing there with a saw when you yeah, go out on a limb. Right, That's and right. cut so, you off. <laughs> so how did your theory work out? We have data now to either verify it or prove it wrong. Yeah, it worked out great. Uh, Super. The planet Uranus, we'll talk about in a moment, uh, it has a strong field and that uh, fitted the prediction. And Neptune turned out to have a strong magnetic field and that fitted the prediction. And it was a numerical prediction, by the way. So. And then Mars has a highly magnetized crust, it turned out. We'll talk about that in the part two of this show. And Mercury's magnetic field uh, decays very rapidly now. And uh, we'll talk about that in part two also. Uh, Voyager 2 visited Uranus, and uh, the creation theory that I had gave a number for how strong its magnetic field should be, and uh, it was right in the same ballpark as that. Uh, so, but the other theory, the dynamo theory it's called, the evolutionary theory, uh, predicted 100,000 times smaller. So it really flunked out at Uranus. So you were 100,000 <laughs> times more accurate than, than the, the other theory. The other theory was That's way tremendous. out. Okay. Okay. Now the next one, uh, Neptune uh, also agreed with my prediction. And by that time, they updated their prediction for Neptune and said, oh, it's like Uranus. And, and so uh, uh, both theories said this, the same thing, but they, they cheated a little. They That's had, right. <laughs> so... Uh, the creation theory said on the order of that number, and the Voyager uh, actually measured uh, right in the same ballpark of that number. So uh, I was very happy about this. And next sure. time we'll talk about two other predictions that I wasn't even expecting would be checked. Okay. So uh, quite happy about uh, how this turned out. Well, it's fascinating. And uh, it all began with you reading a verse in, in Second Peter that said God made the world of water and by water. Mm -hmm. And then you began to apply that to the magnetic field. And uh, uh, it's amazing to me how, uh, based on that, God gave you this insight for you to share with, with the scientific community and with all of us. Well, it's amazing uh, to me, too. I'm glad he, he gave me the clue. You know, my friends, it's so good to have men like Dr. Humphreys who give their lives to studying physics and studying science and saying, does this verify the truth of God and of his word? And Dr. Humphrey says, yes, indeed, it does, right down to our magnetic fields. And this should encourage you to believe in God and to believe his word and to trust him, not just with your science, but with your eternal destiny. He is a God who has proven himself and a God we can trust. Above all else, my friend, I want you to always remember this. It's God's view that he created you. That should be your worldview, too. It's been great having you here in Origins. I hope you'll, get it, you'll join us again soon. And until then, God bless you, my friend. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. 
If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1201, Cornerstone Television, Well, Pennsylvania, 15148.